so Tony and Jess asked me to uh, say something um, about the future of finance um, uh, to sort of round the morning off. And I wasn't really sure uh, what to talk about. So, um, so they said, we'll do something about cryptocurrency. And I said, well, that's boring. I don't want to do that. And they said, well, what about DeFi? I said, well, that's incomprehensible. So <clears throat> what about the metaverse? Because that's incomprehensible and boring. So therefore, <laughs> sort of the perfect topic. So I'm going to try to persuade you um, uh, to pay attention to something that might sound a little bit more futuristic. Um, but uh, I think I'm going to try and prove to you that it really isn't. And um, we should get into it. So um, you don't need to know about me. You do need to go. You do need to buy my books, but that's a separate presentation. Um, <clears throat> so the first point is um, the metaverse is real. So you, you've probably read all sorts of nonsense in the press about this. A lot of me, by the way, um, uh, and have taken the sort of view. Well, this sounds like it's not really a real thing, and indeed. Um, I did write a piece called Opening a Branch in Narnia, just to sort of, Narnia's not a real place, by the way, that's the joke. It's, okay, okay, we'll st can you cut that joke? No, that clearly didn't work, we'll put that to one side. I made a colossal demographic mistake by assuming everybody would know what Narnia is. So, um, uh, but I want to show that, um, although it sounds like it's not real and it's stupid, uh, it is real and it's not stupid. So to take you through this, I'm going to start here. Uh, so you might think like I'm stupid talking about it, but like this is Wells Fargo. I mean, that's like a proper bank, right? So that's Wells, that's a proper bank. And look, they've created this whole island. Um, this is Stagecoach Island. They've created this whole virtual island um, with a bank branch on it and financial services and all this sort of thing. And that, I think that's... I mean, don't you think that's pretty amazing? That's fantastic. The World's Fargo Stage Guide Island. <clears throat> that's from 2005. Um, I was going to try and find an updated version of the picture, but I, I couldn't be bothered, really. So, um, so that's Stagecoach Island. That's 16 years ago. I know things take time in bank land, but uh, you might wonder why I'm showing you a picture of this when this was done 16 years ago. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you why. This is a guy called Richard Bartle, one of my heroes. So Richard Bartle was the guy who, in 1999, co-wrote the first multi-user dungeon, the MUD. Up until this would... You, you don't understand what an astonishing breakthrough this was at the time. Like, creating an imaginary space, this dungeon where you could fight monsters and things like that, but multi-user, so more than one person could log in at a time, and they could interact inside that dungeon. It was only a text, but it was an astonishing thing. And you can see from this message, um, a, a female witch in Wales, I mean, there are quite a lot of them, I think, uh, uh, in Wales, um, ran up a telephone, so they're complaining, they ran up a telephone bill. That was in the old days when you have to dial into things. I'm, I'm using that to illustrate the point that even from day one of this, People really liked it. People really liked going into these online spaces to interact with other people. And not only witches, other people did it as well. Me, for example. This is 1999. That's Richard Bartle who created the mud, or co-created the mud. This is in 2005. That's actually at the Armourer's Hall. I thought it was very funny to have a discussion about magic swords and things like in the Armourer's Hall, uh, under the auspices of the CSFI, Centre for the Early Financial Innovation. And so I invited uh, Richard and um, a woman called Alex Krotowski, you probably know her now from her Radio 4 program about the digital human, to have a discussion about this. I got very fascinated by the fact that not only were these virtual worlds interesting, but these virtual worlds had an economy. I mean there was actual business going on inside the... And that struck me as interesting. Like, here's this new space for fighting dragons with Welsh witches and all this sort of thing. And actually, there's business going on in there. 
<coughs> and uh, Richard gave a presentation on this that absolutely stuck in my mind. I remember it clearly to this day because he said, what's going on is people buying things that don't exist from people that don't own them. It was a very accurate description of those virtual economies. And what he meant by that, well, not only did the things not exist, but the point is, they didn't really... B so if I, if I went into World of Warcraft, for example, which is... That's where I taught my kids economics. You probably did the, the same. In World of Warcraft, uh, if I buy some magic sword from you, stick with... Uh, this really happens, by the way. I mean, you're looking at me like slightly sceptically. This really happens. So if I go into World of Warcraft, I buy a magic sword from Nobby. I'm, it's not really his magic sword. The sword belongs to Blizzard Entertainment Limited, who run World of Warcraft. And Blizzard Entertainment, at any point, could arbitrarily delete that sword or create a million of them or whatever. So when I was teaching my kids when they were young, so what they would do when they were playing World of Warcraft is you go into World of Warcraft and you find the new kids who don't really know how to play it and you don't really know what everything's worth and then you buy stuff off them and then you corner the market in the particular magic sword that everybody wants, and then you can jack up the price. And I wanted them to be investment bankers. That was, the, <laughs> that was my theory behind that. Things that don't exist from people that don't own them. <clears throat> now, actually, buying things that don't exist from people that didn't own them was a colossal business, and it's only got bigger. 2001, Edward Castronova, who wrote a very good book about this called Wild Cap Currency a few years later, he calculated that the GNP per head of Norath, which is a place that doesn't exist, it's in Sony's EverQuest, the GDP per head, the GNP per head, was somewhere between Bulgaria and Russia. In other words, as a person, you were better off living and working in Norath than in Bulgaria which is probably still true. And I, I'm not saying this is a slight on Bulgaria or Bulgarians. I had a lovely time the last time I went to Sofia. Actually, the <laughs> I don't know if there's anybody Bulgarian in the audience, but I thought it was very reassuring. Um, I was at a hotel, and we asked the chap at the hotel where was a nice restaurant to go to, and he gave us some directions. And one of my colleagues is of more a nervous disposition. said, so, well, is it safe? to go out and walk around to go to these restaurants. And the guy at the hotel actually said, yes, don't worry about it, the police have got snipers on the roof. <laughs> Which was, was meant to be. So do you understand how that's not reassuring to, um, I mean, he thought he was being very, yeah, no, there's snipers, don't worry about it, so. So as a person, you could make a logical decision to sort of withdraw from this world and go and live in Norath, and you'd be better off than withdrawing from this world and going to live in Bulgaria. And I thought that was rather an interesting cusp in human history that deserved a little bit of investigation. Now, that was baby stuff. If you look at the numbers for what's going on now, you all understand, I'm sure, that the computer games business, which is the origin of this virtual world stuff, is bigger than Hollywood, bigger than music, bigger than everything. It is absolutely colossal. And within that business, the buying and selling of things that don't exist from people that don't own them is now more than a $50, a $50 billion business, just in those games there, Farmville and so on. I haven't done the GMP per head calculations, but you're probably better off being a farmer in Farmville than on Jersey. I mean, I don't know. We'd have to do the calculations. To see how, I don't know how the subsidies work. We'd have to do the calculations. <laughs> but, but... But people do this for a living. And actually, when I was involved, I was involved in another project a few years ago looking at some stuff, we, we went to talk. So, so basically, there were people in China who were mining gold in one of these virtual games. Because it, it, so if you're doing it as a person, it's boring, right? So I wouldn't do it because you have to go and mine all this gold. And then you sell the gold to people. And people use the gold to buy the magic sword. But I didn't want to spend the time mucking about. So you would pay somebody in China to go and mine the gold for you, and then they, you'd give them a slice of it for their trouble, and then you would use it to buy the magic sword so you could just play with the magic sword. And an elementary calculation showed that mining imaginary gold in China was a much better business than buying actual gold in China, especially with their you know, widely renowned attention to health and safety in the mining industry. 
So as a rational decision, you were better off mining virtual gold than actual gold. I think the gold price relatively is actually lower now than it was then. And Castronova said, just because these things aren't real, it's wrong to think of them as play or fake or anything like that. Like, just because something's not real doesn't mean it can't have incredible value and be the basis for economics. But these economies, so why are we all here? Why aren't we all working in Fortnite? That's Fortnite down there. Has anybody here actually played? Again, let's go with the demographics of the audience and exclude Hamish. <laughs> Has anybody else here ever been in Fortnite? Okay, so you, but everybody here understands what it is, even if they've not been in it themselves. It's, um, it's a game where you parachute in and kill everybody else, in summary. <laughs> personally, it's not my sort of... I, personally, I'm a football manager kind of guy, so it's not my sort of game. But do you understand how many millions of people play these games simultaneously around the world? It's astonishing. But somehow, we're not living in that world yet. We're living here, and we're making money here. So why is that? Well, it's because of that issue about ownership. Like, as Richard said, the people in Fortnite that are buying and selling things in Fortnite and spending enormous amounts of money... Again, I realise this sounds implausible, but there are kids who want their pocket money in Fortnite money because they want to use it to buy nice clothes for the person in... Seriously. They want, they want to buy nice clothes for the person in Fortnite. But it's not real property. It doesn't really belong to them. It belongs to the people that run Fortnite. And if you read the small print of the license conditions, it will say something like... Well, it will say something like, we can do whatever we like, and there's nothing you can do about it, in summary. So what is it that changes those into the metaverse that everyone is going nuts about? And the answer is, it's all about tokens. So we're going to have a couple of minutes diversion into the world of tokens uh, to try to test my theory of everything um, about why everything is going to be tokenized in the future. So here is my, here is my theory of everything. Um, I think Stephen Hawkins is probably more concise, but... Um, We'll go with it for the moment. So here's my theory of everything. And so just so you can understand how this stuff locates. So up here we've got tokens. And there are two different kinds of tokens. There are tokens that have a value that's intrinsic to their environment. So that's things like Bitcoin or whatever. And there are things that have an extrinsic value. So I'm going to use the word cryptocurrency for the things where the value is intrinsic. And I'm going to use the word crypto asset uh, where the value is extrinsic and bound to something that has an existence outside the ledger. And then the world of DeFi is this set of protocols here, which do the automated exchange of cryptocurrency and crypto assets. We're not going to cover that much today. Uh, if you look at the crypto assets, there's two different kinds of crypto assets. There's things that are all the same and things that are different. Are, are you with this? Am I not? Okay, good. I just, uh, just want to make sure people can follow it around here. So... There's things that are all the same, and there's things that are different. And the things that are all the same are things that, for historical reasons, we call fungible. And fungible things are very different from non-fungible things, not just because they're different, uh, but because they have a different function within society. So one of the key characteristics of money, and one of the reasons why whatever Bitcoin is, it isn't money, is that money has to be fungible. Something that's not fungible can't be money for all sorts of legal, historical, and other reasons. So basically, if I steal Tony's money, money is fungible. You can't come and get that specific money back from me. If I steal Tony's car and I sell it to somebody else, you can go to them and get the car back. It's still their car, even though I sold it to somebody else. It's not fungible, but money is fungible. <clears throat> We're not going to talk about fungible things. We're just going to talk about not fungible things. If we look at the world of not fungible things, we can divide those into two groups. There are not fungible things that are useful, and there are not fungible things that are useless. We call that art, by the way, it's for <laughs> historical reasons. So not fungible things that are useless, I mean, I'm not being mean to artists, but that's kind of what art is. That's the, 
I mean, the Mona Lisa isn't useful. You can't cook on it or, you know what I mean? It's just, it's useless. That doesn't mean you don't like it and admire it and whatever, but it doesn't do anything. I'm the wrong person to talk about that stuff anyway. I, w I wouldn't have bought the Mona Lisa in a junkyard sale. I mean, it's like, have you seen it? It's tiny. It's not worth, I would want something much bigger for the money, wouldn't you, if I was going to? Anyway, the point is, I'm not an art person, so don't listen to me about art. But the point is, there are useless things and there are useful things. And useful things that are not fungible, we're going to call property for all sorts of historical and legal reasons. And property has a very fundamentally important characteristic in that property is the basis of the economies that we want to live in. That is, not North Korea. So the economies that we want to live in are economies that have property. And it doesn't matter whether that property, this is the big, this is the big intellectual leap that you're going to have to take into the metaverse with both feet. It doesn't matter if that property is virtual or real. What the economy needs is property. Whether that property is a virtual or real doesn't make any difference. We can have an economy. And when the virtual stuff, it's in the metaverse, and when it's real stuff, it's in the universe, okay? So the important point about this is property, okay? So why do tokens mean property and therefore the metaverse? Well, <clears throat> once you have virtual things, which can be, I mean, one of the characteristic things about software is that you can copy it. That's why, you know, record companies don't like it, just to use an example from 25 years ago, so that we're on the same ground. <coughs> Software is a lot of po uh, post-scarcity. We're into post-scarcity economics. And the example of post-scarcity economics that everybody is familiar with is, of course, Star Trek. Please tell me I haven't made a demographic catastrophic mistake. Come on, you must have heard of Star Trek, even if you haven't heard of Narnia. So... Uh, so Star Trek is the post-scarcity economy. And as I mentioned, of course, it's 1960s hippie nonsense, but just go with it for the moment. In Star Trek, there was only one thing that wasn't post-scarce, right? It, there was post-scarcity because, you remember, you had the replicators. So anything you wanted, you could put it in the replicator. You could replicate anything, right? It didn't matter. Your post-scarcity, anything you wanted, the replicator could produce it, except for one thing. The one thing that couldn't be put through a replicator was gold-pressed latinum. And gold-pressed latinum was what was used as money by the Ferengi. So if we put to one side the thinly-veiled anti-Semitic tropes around the Ferengi and use them for the purposes that I want to in this presentation, they illustrate the point that the valuable thing is the thing that can't be copied. The stuff that can be copied isn't valuable. The thing that you can't copy is the thing that's valuable. So this is an NFT. That's CryptoPunk998. That's the world's most expensive NFT, non-fungible token. And that was sold for $500 million. $500 million. Now, albeit the guy sold it to himself, uh, but that's to do with a different point. <laughs> Yes, no, well, what he did was he, he, you know, you have these flash loans within Ethereum blocks. So what he did was he took out a flash loan for $500 million, bought the NFT, and with the proceeds, the $500 million, he paid back the loan. So now the NFT was worth $500 million. If you look on the blockchain, now the NFT is worth $500 million. But actually, he bought and sold it to himself. So, and that's because these NFTs are used for... Um, basically, you know, money laundering and tax evasion and, well, art, you know, the same thing. That's what they're, <laughs> it's conclusive proof. Uh, but just because people are selling pictures of chimpanzees with sunglasses on for hundreds of million dollars to themselves as part of vast money laundering, as The Economist points out this week with fantastic good timing for my presentation, uh, that doesn't mean we should mock it. Because the existence of real property means the existence of a real economy. 
And in the example of a real economy, you would necessarily have real financial services, which we're going to come on to in a minute. So I hope I've convinced you so far of the logic. So the logic is we had virtual worlds, but they didn't have real economies because they didn't have real property. Along come NFTs, which you can't copy, right? The whole point about the blockchain is these things can't be copied. Remember Mark Zuckerberg said he was going to make sending money around the internet as easy as sending a picture of a cat. But of course, that kind of misunderstands the nature of the two operations, scarcity and post-scarcity. If I send Tony a picture of my cat, I'm not really sending him the picture of my cat. I'm sending him a copy of it. I've still got the picture of my cat. That works very well for pictures of cats, not so well for money, generally speaking. The point about NFTs is you can't. If I send Tony my picture of a chimpanzee with sunglasses on, it's now his picture of a chimpanzee with sunglasses on. I don't own it anymore. There's no double spend. So we take virtual worlds, we add real property, uh, that's the wrong word. We take virtual worlds, we add property, which is virtual but can now be owned, and Richard Bartle's statement must now be amended to being economies based on things that don't exist but people do own them. And that's the important part for the economy. Not the exist part, the own part. That's why the economists just don't want the metaverse. Okay, a slight diversion before we come back into financial services for a moment, because I just want to make a couple of points about the implications of this um, if we don't pay too much attention to it. Um, and this is what I've taken to calling the flight to the suburbs. So um, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, Umberto Eco's uh, masterpiece of postmodernism, Travels in Hyperreality, right? No, you hadn't even heard of Narnia. Why would you have heard of Umberto Eco's Travels in Hyperreality? I complete miscalculation with the audience here. Remember, Eco, the essence of postmodernism is, is what? What is this audience? The essence of postmodernism is what? Relativism, right? It's the fact that you, know, you have no fixed point of view. They're all relative. What Umberto Eco said is we should be using these technologies not to build virtual realities, in other words, simulations of the world as it exists, although actually he argued, as you'll see in a second, he, he said you know, we mustn't use these things to be nostalgic for Disneyland. In other words, we mustn't build virtual worlds that actually didn't really exist, but encode you know, values which are actually specific to very particular sort of cultural perspectives. I know you're wondering where all this is going. Okay, so <clears throat> there's a really big difference between virtual reality and hyper-reality. Virtual reality is a version of the world as it is. Hyper-reality is a version of the world as it should be. In other words, we have the opportunity to build virtual worlds with that property in that work the way we want it to work. If we just build virtual reality, if we just build the version of the world that we have now, but with tokens, you end up with basically the world we have now, but even worse, because, because the world of cryptocurrency is, is uh, far more concentrated and the power structures are much more uneven. So we need to take a more active role in forming these things. Letting these people just build the metaverse for the purposes of money laundering and tax evasion with pictures of chimpanzees with sunglasses on, all well and good, but probably we want to set the bar a little bit higher than that. We probably want to take a more active role in the construction of these. And I just want to... Now, you see, this is a very funny joke, uh, which no one has got, but so I'll have to explain it to you all. Okay, so that picture... So Tony and I have some shared heritage, because a long, long time ago, we helped to launch the world's first central bank digital currency, well, ooh, you know, you might at least gasp at that. So a long time, Tony and I helped to launch the world's first digital, digital, central bank digital currency. That's not even the astonishing part. So the astonishing part is in Swindon. <laughs> so, uh, and everyone knows what Swindon is famous for. The roundabout, the magic roundabout, the heart of Swindon. So that is, that is a virtual reality version that someone built in SimCity of the Magic Roundabout in Swindon. 
And as anyone can tell you who's ever been to Swindon, it doesn't look like that. It doesn't look leafy and pleasant and lovely like that. It's a tarmac-encrusted hellhole covered in skid marks and white lines and whatever. This is what Echo says about, that's what he says about being nostalgic for Disneyland, this is what he means. Now, the reason why that's particularly interesting in this case is because the launch of the world's first central bank digital currency in Swindon with me and Tony, there is me at the launch, by the way, there in 1995, the launch of the world's first digital currency in Swindon is only the second most improbable thing about Swindon. Only second. The world's first digital currency comes in at number two. Doesn't even make it to the top. The most improbable thing about Swindon is that Swindon was actually twinned with Disneyland. <laughs> I am not joking. I'm completely serious. You can Google it and look it up if you want to. The most improbable thing about Swindon is it was actually twinned with Disneyland. So in my improbable wander through post-realism, uh, post-modernism, relativism, why we want hyper reality and not virtual reality, Swindon looms very large in this argument, and you can't argue with that. So there is the magic roundabout in Swindon in virtual reality, not in hyper reality. Here's the second most improbable thing that ever happened in Swindon, and here's the most improbable happening thing in Swindon, which happens to be Disneyland, which we're not supposed to be nostalgic for. So why am I telling you all of that? Because there are very serious... So, so it's one thing to joke about, um, you know, drug dealing, money laundering, chimpanzees wearing sunglasses, uh, but actually there's a serious issue underneath it, which is this. The balkanization of the web as it is now um, will get a lot worse in the metaverse if we don't do something more active to create a more healthy environment. And that's because uh, of, if you imagine the, the sort of physical version of this, the flight to the suburbs, right? So you, you go to a space where you feel more safe, where you're with people that are more like you, where you can use gated communities to, to exclude. But they're in, in the real world, they're imperfect, you know? But in the metaverse, they're not. Because it isn't a gate that's keeping the other people out, it's cryptography. You know, it's the whole code is law. So we create a virtual environment for all of us to operate in, and it has certain rules, and if Nobby breaks the rules, you can delete him. End of. That's it. Gone. You can't even see him banging on the door trying to get back in. The key's gone. The encryption's gone. He's gone. So the suburbs are a perfect gated community, whereas the suburbs aren't. And I think the, the, the warning that I'm flagging up is that we, we need to take a more active role in the creation of these new methods. Don't just let, you know, the big tech guys do it. We, don't, we want hyper-reality. We want the metaverse as it should. We want an economy, a society as it should be not as an imperfect representation of as it is now. So I, I want to make a serious point to you about why people like me think we should be getting more involved in this, uh, particularly at the big corporate level. OK, so now let's finish up by bringing this back together. So what on earth has all this got to do with finance? Well, the point is, if you're sitting here shaking your head at all of this nonsense, and thinking, why on earth would anyone buy a magic sword and trade it and whatever? You know, do NFTs really add up to anything, or is it just a stupid thing, a bit like skateboards or CB radio that we'll all have heard the end of fairly soon? Uh, well, the answer is people are already... People are already getting very serious about what... The, so this is the Financial Times. You can't get more serious than that. And the Financial Times said the metaverse is about these digital assets, the property that I was talking about, but also about the digital identity of the people that own it. In other words, you need both of those things to make a working market. You need the property that can be owned, and you need the identities that can own it. And you have to have both parts of that to make the whole thing work properly. And uh, the interoperability of those, I like Jaron Lanier, wrote this many years ago, but he used the word economic avatars. 
um, for these identities that own property in the metaverse. I, rather, I like that. I like that phrase. Creating these economic avatars and managing them um, is what banks should do, I think, right? Because you want those things to be trusted. You want them to be in a regulated framework. And if people do get up to no good with it, you need to be able to actually do something about it. Um, uh, oddly, in the, in the cyber version of it, probably. I mean, the thing is, if, if this is essentially a reputation and economy where you have these persistent pseudonyms trading these activities, then the history the reputation, becomes the most valuable asset of the identity. Taking away that reputation becomes a much better punishment than, than you know, sending people to jail for six months or something like that. So. so just to finish, I want to show you two examples of financial services businesses that are already operating in a metaverse, not the metaverse, in a metaverse. Once you have real property, then you can do things with it. So, so in the first example, people are buying imaginary land in these virtual worlds and renting it out to other people who want to come and live in these virtual worlds. And I, see what I've done there? I call it, now I think this is brilliant, but I mean, you may have your own opinions. So I call that the bourgeoisie, which I, <laughs> see, come on, isn't that brilliant? I, like I expected more from this audience. Yeah, you rise to the bourgeoisie. There are people buying this imaginary land and renting it out to other people, and they're getting more. N now, this is not some science fiction thing we're making up. This is happening right now. And of course, they're doing it through these DeFi protocols. So it's not happening through the existing financial system. There are people already, <laughs> I mean, I think this is brilliant, a pawn shop in the metaverse. So I've bought Nobby's magic sword, not a euphemism, I've bought, <laughs> I've bought Nobby's, I apologize, I couldn't resist the joke, I'm sorry. I've bought Nobby's magic sword, but I'm not actually using it for the moment. So I take it down the pawn shop and get some virtual currency to go off and do some gambling slash investing on other things. Again, happening right now. So if you think, uh, as I think you may have thought at the beginning of the conversation, that it's all a bit of a joke and let these people sell chimpanzees with sunglasses to each other till the cows come home and we're not worried about it. Um, I have to say, you're completely wrong. You have to take it seriously. And I, I want you to take it seriously because I, I want it to be our hyper-reality and not a virtual reality that's foisted on us uh, by third parties that may not share our, our goals and aspirations. Anyway, so thank you very much. I hope you know what the metaverse is now. <laughs>